Boom, okay. okay, you try your little sauces. I'm just gonna try it plain. Wow, adventurous. As long as I'm trying something freaky already, I just want to get the full effect. The outside is definitely a little cooked, but yeah, the middle part is raw chicken. Like oh my gosh, okay, raw chicken in Japan, trying it for the first time. I'm a little scared, I'm a lot scared. Let's do it. Here we go. Last year, with the help of buyfood.com, I traveled to Tokyo, Japan. Sushi, ramen, sashimi, sake, sake, sake. Is that the right way? From food that can kill you. The poison hit my muscle quickly. to food you have to kill. So right now he's shelling the shrimp. The main thing about this shrimp is that it's alive right now. Beautiful, ugly, and everything in between. Ooh, raw horse, I've never had raw horse, man. This is nuts. So what do you focus on when you feel like you've already covered everything? This time I'm coming back for round two and we're going deeper in Japan than any film crew has before on a mission to hunt down the most unique food you'll find anywhere in the world. Our effort is not fruitless. Here, he's caught one. Oh, what the f <laughs> Eight videos in eight cities from Sendai all the way down to Fukuoka. By my side, Shizuka Anderson, TV host and radio personality, raised in Canada, but living in Japan for the last 10 years. Welcome to Japan by Food. I'm your host, Shizuka Anderson. Shizzy is a self-described food lover, but this trip may put that claim to the test. Now, she's told me to put this on it. I'm not sure what this does. Oh, it bit the spoon. Oh. In Japan, food is more than just food. It's an art worthy of perfecting for a lifetime. A place where the drive for quality compels shop owners to never expand beyond their 10-seat ramen shops. Where over hundreds of years, meticulous livestock owners bred the most expensive and best tasting beef in the world. <laughs> Where strict adherence to food and beverage guidelines makes dishes like raw chicken and raw beef sashimi safe to eat. This eight video series will show you a side of Japan you have never seen before. Our cross country Japan by food journey kicks off in the nation's capital, Tokyo. In this city, ramen is life. It is one of those foods you can find on almost every street corner. Tokyo has over 10,000 ramen shops, and it could take a lifetime to taste them all. Mm. Today, we're sampling three vastly different styles of ramen at three different price tags. We have come to our first noodley location behind us right now, 7-Eleven. Completely different from 7-Elevens in the USA because here it has nothing to do with gasoline. The one thing you can't get here. Here you'll find everything you need in one place. Classic cup noodles with countless flavors, microwavable noodles in a bowl, or fiery noodles in case you're wanting to ravage your bowels. But something even more special has caught my eye. We have just snuck into a 7-Eleven. We have no permission and this is illegal. Oh, okay, we just gotta look. Just act That's natural. Casual. Act natural. I'm just... So right here, they have something I've never seen before. It's kind of frozen noodles. That's right. This is your most standard Japanese style ramen. It is a soy sauce based ramen with lots Whoa. of chopping. It's only 185 yen. Whoa, that's like $1.85. Okay, we're gonna make this. Actually, we're gonna ask them to make this for us because the microwaves are all behind the counter. I did not get kicked out of the 7-Eleven, did you? I didn't, no. I walked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right now our ramen noodles are soaking up this hot broth. What I do love is that even though it's frozen, even though it's from a 7-Eleven, they got a slice of chashu pork, and I'm gonna just get like the best bite of this whole meal right here. Let's go for it. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, we're good. There are actually a number of good qualities to this. One is the quality of the noodles. I would say it's a really good dough. It tastes like a freshly rolled noodle. Point two. Point two. The soup is also quite good. Let's just take a sip of it properly. It's not as like rich and fatty as your normal broth, mm -hmm. but not bad. The chashu is kind of hard. But I still like the flavor of it. Mm -hmm. I think for $2, plus the experience of being in the 7-Eleven, interacting with the local people, getting kicked out, people threatening to call the police on you, all of that combined into one experience for absolutely a 
big bang for your buck. Yeah, almost yeah. a priceless experience, really. Priceless, yeah, we can't even put a price on this. No. We've come to our second location, an actual ramen shop. This is the menu right here. You just walk up here, put your money in, and you get a ticket like you're going on a roller coaster. <laughs> Except the only roller coaster we're gonna go on is a roller coaster of flavor for our mouths. You got that? The ramen game in Tokyo ain't easy. The quality, pricing, restaurant ambiance, it's all gotta be tops if you wanna stick around. And Ori Yoshio is earning their keep. This is a special Ore Ryu, which means my way. Can I add stuff? Yes. These are the add-ons down here. Ooh, there's cheese gyoza, cheese dumpling. Ooh, this is a... Crispy fried chicken with, oh, I don't know how to read that. Oh, what is this? It says basil ramen. But in Japanese, it's called genovese, which is a pasta basil sauce. Should we get two? Let's do it. Basil ramen or genovese ramen, perhaps named after the Genovese crime family of New York, is a little touch of Italy, bringing ramen to the next level as long as you aren't a snitch. They stir fry a mixture of veggies, including cabbage, bok choy, onions, carrots, and mushrooms. Add in chicken and pork bone stock, their Genovese sauce, and pepper. Drop in those nudes, then top it with chasu pork, bamboo shoots, spinach, green onions, a soft boiled egg, and finely minced hot chilies. This is gorgeous. It's like a work of art. This red part looks like saffron, but it's not saffron. It is not. It's called ito togarashi, which means thread red peppers. Ito togarashi. Yeah. I realize what Fine. we should actually do is try some of this broth. Okay. Because this is what makes it so special. It's green. It's got basil. Let's try it out. Wow. That's creamy. It's not a crazy intense herbal flavor. It's not a punch to the mouth. Yeah. It's a kiss on the lips. That's a beautiful way to put it. I was with ramen expert Frank nearly one year ago. Mm -hmm. He had like ramen terminology. You know, it's a very dramatic pull up with the noodles. You've got oh. noodle terminology. You, he calls it, call a it a pull up. up. <laughs> He's like, I'll do a deep pull and then an aggressive suck. <laughs> yeah. That's a yummy noodle. Noodles are still a bit firm. I like that they're very thin. I would say it's a lighter tasting meal. All right, Kai, check out this suck. Get a nice close up on this. Is there a better word for it? I don't know. A slurp, maybe? A slurp. Yeah, I'll stop oh, calling it that. <laughs> Slurp. So this is just under 10 bucks. Yes. I'm very curious to see at the next location how they're gonna elevate something from nine to ten dollars all the way up to a hundred dollars. Maybe like a couple extra meat slices? Ooh, maybe it'll be rhino horn. That's pretty exotic. Yeah. You can't even get those in Japan. <laughs> well, maybe today. Day ramen is versatile. For eight to ten dollars, you can get squid ink, black as night, darker than my heart. This is the lunch of my dream. This Chinese-inspired mega thick broth. It's hard to get out. The broth is almost like fighting against you to pull it back. Down. Yeah. They even have soupless ramen. What? I thought that was illegal. I didn't think you could do that. Now it's legal. <laughs> but how would you elevate Japanese ramen to its highest potential if price was not an issue? The answer lies here. Do you know anything about this place? Nothing. Great. Right now we're at Noodle Stand Tokyo. It is both ethical and ramen. Yes. Do you know why it's ethical? I have no idea. I actually just noticed that. Noodle Stand Tokyo just opened two years ago and they already have a loyal following. They use only ingredients sourced from Japan, even writing the origin of each ingredient on the menu. I checked out the menu already. Their most expensive ramen is only around $11. Today they're making $100 ramen. It's not gonna be 10 times the size. They're doing something to it to make it more expensive. What do you hope is on there? I am hoping for truffles because I love truffles, but they're known to be very expensive. Oh, I'm hoping for diamonds. Diamonds, that'd be, even that'd be even better. That'd be even better. Like earrings? I came from the mud, dirt on my hands. Meet the man behind the noodles. Strong like a tree. Are you ready for this? A demonstration of my respect for you making this $100 ramen. <laughs> <laughs> Ramen master, Takeshi Nishimaki, 
He spent 20 years in the noodle game, and today he's pushing past the limits of typical ramen. What is your approach for this luxurious $100 ramen? The main idea is to use Japanese locally sourced ingredients and also Japanese wagyu. That seems like the most logical step, just upgrade the protein a lot. Is there any ingredient that you would never really find in your typical $10 ramen? <laughs> Today, we've decided to throw in a little bit of foie gras oh. to keep it fancy. Yes. And also truffles. You're right. I called it. <laughs> if this is a big hit, people come in here wanting the $100 ramen, will you add it to your menu? Hi. Yes, definitely. Sir, I'm very excited. Let's do it. First, the Wagyu steak is seared in oil and garlic, then sprinkled with salt and pepper. He adds a blend of sake and soy sauce, and finally cuts the steak into irresistibly succulent slices. Next up, sukiyaki, thin beef slices, dipped in a mixture of soy sauce, sugar, and seaweed. Now it's time to bring it all together. Our giant bowl, that we're definitely sharing because I can't afford to, is filled with a soy sauce base, oyster sauce, and a dreamy, milky broth. The noodles are delicately placed in the center, stacked with slices of beautiful rare wagyu. Now the sukiyaki, white asparagus, naganegi, half a seasoned egg, a douse of truffle oil on the beef, bonito or dried fish flakes, and finally, as a pure symbol of over-the-top opulence, pure gold flakes. Here we are. I've never been so excited to eat something as I am right now. Neither have I. I think this is a collection of all the finest ingredients in Japan. Japan. The best bonito flakes, the best gold. This is a very special brand of egg called Okukujina, which is apparently one of the higher quality eggs in Japan. It's a good egg. We've got this beautiful wagyu on each side, two different cuts. I think we can get just a piece of this because it's one, it's got gold. Two, it's got truffle sauce. Three, it's wagyu, and that's enough. That was outstanding. Whoa! That's one of the best bites of my life. Truffle can usually be too much or too little, mm -hmm. and that was perfect. The wagyu just melts in your mouth, very tender. It's got some broth still clinging to it, so it's rich, savory. That was amazing. That was a taste of heaven. <laughs> this here is the sirloin. Have you ever felt so fancy? Eating wagyu beef, like, covered in gold. God damn. That is remarkably tender. It actually melts in your mouth. It's very rich and very fatty. Take a look, guys. This might be the best bite of ramen that exists anywhere. We've got Wagyu A5, some bonito, some noodles, some broth. Oh, that is so good. The combination of everything just explodes in your mouth. That broth has like a deep savoriness to it. You can get that umami in there. Yeah, all together it's incredibly rich. Here they have something I've never seen combined with ramen, a kind of a foie gras paste. Yeah. They said we can actually just kind of mix it into the broth mm -hmm. and then even put a little extra on a bite. So I want to try that. It changes everything. It's just like a more fatty, rich note at the end of the eating cycle. <laughs> <laughs> you guys buying this? <laughs> I think the eating cycle is a little bit later than the eating cycle. <laughs> <laughs> We came to the nice folks here at Noodle Stand and we asked them, hey, can you make an outstanding, top of the line, luxurious, opulent ramen? And honestly, they delivered hardcore. It looks amazing, it tastes even better, and I couldn't be more satisfied. I agree. Like, this is meant for one person. We shared it, but I would say good bang for your buck. Good bang for my buck, that's for sure. <laughs> Not my buck. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese cross-country food tour has officially begun, moving from Tokyo to the city of Sendai. Sendai is known for Sendai Gyu, which is uh, Sendai Wagyu beef. Sendai is the largest city in the Tohoku region, a city popular for delicacies that you can't find just anywhere. Oh, look at that egg yolk! 
Today is all about the famous Japanese tradition of eating meat raw. Honestly, it's not really my thing that I want to be eating, but I'm gonna do it. I don't know how it's anybody's thing. Today we're taking raw meats to the extreme. This Are isn't that... a normal food to oh, eat. She's... Concluding with the most dangerous food I have ever eaten, raw chicken. I am shocked that this food even exists. <laughs> Welcome to Katora, a restaurant specializing in raw beef dishes, including their own raw beef on rice. We are in the kitchen with Mr. Daisuke Shoji. Sir, thank you so much for having us today. Oh, sorry, nice. double handshake, double handshake, ultra respect. How long have people been eating raw beef in Japan? Historically speaking, in Japan, we haven't been eating raw meat just because it is dangerous. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Eating raw beef can be highly risky since it may contain bacteria like E. coli or salmonella, and both could prove fatal. Is it worth the risk? Yes. Yes. That's 100 percent confident. That was a big yes. What is so special about raw beef? Oh, you don't even need to translate that. I felt that <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> I love this guy's Flavor. passion for beef. <laughs> yes. I saw this laying around. Can you tell me about this one? This is actually just beef. Sushi doesn't mean raw fish, it means sour rice, and it's the same rice used to make raw beef nigiri, an oblong hand-pressed mound of rice and a thin slice of raw beef, covered with a bit of wasabi and finally brushed with soy sauce. Please share in this moment with me. Here's mine. Ooh. Cheers. Mmm. Oh. Oishi. Mm -hmm. That is so good. Surprisingly has a lot of layers for being so simple. The little bit of wasabi and then just the salt on top with the soy sauce. Wow, that was a great appetizer. Thank you so much. Today we came especially for the yuke, a Japanese dish similar to beef tartare. And Katora was the first restaurant in Japan to serve it. To prepare the raw beef safely, the restaurant first blanches a large cut of top round at a high temperature to kill any existing bacteria on the meat surface. Then they cut away the cooked section, leaving only pristine and bacteria-free raw beef that is perfectly safe to eat. From here, they mince the beef by knife, adding an in-house sauce, sesame oil, and a mixture of vinegar and miso. Plate it, top it with an egg yolk, and garnish with cucumber, green onions, sesame seeds, and a flour. Here we are. We have this tiny, cute, adorable creation for about $15, right? Yeah, but before we eat it, did you know that someone has actually died eating this before? Really? Actually, five people have died eating this. This seems like folklore. It actually happened in 2011. It was huge news all over Japan, and because of that, they forced lots of restaurants to stop serving it. Why are you so happy as you tell this story? No, not <laughs> one person. Five of them died. Five. Isn't that great? Let's do uh, less thinking and more chewing. Nice break. That is so gorgeous. This is one of the gooeyest foods I've ever tried. Here we go. Wow. Whoa! That's worth dying for. Yeah, <laughs> it really <laughs> is, it really is. The egg goes so well with this. It's very creamy, mm. melty, soft. And the texture, you know, it's not just straight minced, it's like half chopped, half minced. There's still a lovely texture in your mouth too. From here, when will we find out if we might die? Good question. I have no tomorrow. idea. It won't no be idea. during this video. Our next stop, Nanbu Izakaya, a Japanese pub run by Miss Uchinda Kanako since its inception seven years ago. The afterward crowd can't get enough of her odang, Japanese fish cakes, and our next raw food delicacy, shark heart. We are here right now with Miss Kanako. Thank you so much for having us. I'm told you have raw shark heart. Is this true? <laughs> It's true. She says yes with pride. How many people are eating this shark heart? About half of all the customers will order this shark heart. To some in Japan, shark meat has a long list of health benefits, not the least of which includes skyrocketing male libido. But I'm sure it's good for other stuff too. I love your restaurant. I love the feel in here. I can see that you have a heart and I can't wait to see you put your heart into making the shark heart. Shark meat, especially the organs, have an intense ammonia aroma that needs to be flushed out over a couple of hours. Can I smell it? The meat itself is cut into thin slices and the arteries are chopped even more finely. Boom, the raw shark heart. What I like is that it's not just heart, it's heart and valves. Why don't you grab some? <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't even mean to say that. 
say that. <laughs> That's all right. Just go from the heart. One, two, three. Oh, you actually did it? Huh? Oh my God. I'm not gonna eat that. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Here we go. Mm. The texture is very. It's like a firm sponginess. The flavor is not strong at all. When you mix it with the sesame oil, it's just kind of a rich, smoky, salty flavor. But here we have valve, and that's gotta be easier, right? You were doing great at the beef part. Mm. What happened? I'm not an organ girl. <laughs> Must be a lonely life. <laughs> Let's try it out. Here we go. <laughs> the texture is completely different. Chewy. In Japanese, we say kori kori. Oh, it's so kori kori. The only thing I can compare it to is a penis fish. It's like eating tendons. I like it. I like the texture. It's a little funky. And all you need on the side is like a couple liters of sake to really bring it home. Yep, that'll do it. Our last stop today, Knee Diamond. Since 2008, they have been serving a specialty that if prepared incorrectly, can actually kill you. I'm talking about raw chicken. How many people in Japan have died from eating raw chicken? I actually haven't heard of anyone dying. At least it hasn't become, you know, wild news. Or the raw chicken mafia just sweeps it under the rug. They're serving it behind us. Let's go inside and figure out how this works. Mr. Keta Karino, thank you so much for having us today. Hi. Are you terrified? Are you excited? There's literally millions of people watching right now. Doki Doki, this is. What is Doki Doki? It's, like it's an onomatopoeia doki doki. for your heart pumping. Oh. Doki doki. Okay. Here you have a, a couple special things on the menu. First of all, horse meat. <laughs> horse meat is a popular dish from Kyushu in southern Japan. And it's actually more common than you'd think. Eaten in Mexico, Switzerland, Indonesia. I even tried some in Uzbekistan. Mm. But Japan is the only place I've seen serve it raw. You know, what separates horse meat from any other animal like beef or beef? Horse meat is completely different from eating raw beef. You can enjoy this and not be afraid of dying. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I really look for when I eat food. It's like, ah, uh, not dying. Mr. Keita tried his first basashi when he traveled to Kyushu. It was love at first bite, and he's been serving fresh horse basashi ever since. He cuts the meat into paper-thin slices, served simply with a side of garlic miso paste and scallions. Let's go for it. Mmm. Mmm. I love that. Ooh, that is really good. A little more firm. Mm hmm Oh, and then it has an interesting aftertaste. It's a bit horsey. What's the taste of horse? It's hard to explain. I mean, it's heavy, it's robust. You gotta try horse, unless you like horses a lot, but then you can still try it anyways, and just don't tell the horse that who is your friend. Our final dish, raw chicken. If any food kills me on this show, it will be this one. I mean, I'm actually scared this time. The Japan tour hasn't even started, and it could be over already. I am shocked that this food even exists. I've been all over the world eating crazy stuff, and honestly, nothing scares me more than what we're about to try right now. Have you ever heard of someone getting sick from eating raw chicken? Those are the names of all the people who have died? No, no, that no, wasn't all the names. This is a really common dish. Sir, my life is in your hands and my bowels <laughs> also in your hands. Let's do this. Hi, do what? Hi. The raw chicken achieves safe eating status using the same preparation method as the raw beef. The outside chicken breast is briefly blanched, killing any bacteria or salmonella. What remains is the raw, bacteria-free inside. The chicken sashimi is sliced thin and spread on a plate, like an alluring raw chicken flour. Raw chicken sashimi. I am doki doki. Doki doki. Doki doki. All right, let's do this. I'm just gonna try it plain. Wow, adventurous. I just want to get the full effect. It looks like it was cooked rare. Let's do it. Let's do it. Wow, that is actually surprisingly very good. I like it. Like, I am very pleasantly surprised. I was ready for like a raw chicken type of texture, but no, it's, it's kind of melt in your mouth. It did yeah. anything but melt in my mouth. It was stubborn. Okay, I'm gonna try it with some sauce. 
it's it's literally like eating sushi. I can definitely tell I'm eating raw chicken. It doesn't take me to like a different world or anything. I'm so confused, like all the flavors are there, mm -hmm. but my brain is so conditioned to not eat raw chicken that it's like mistake, mistake, mistake with every bite. Like hearing his explanation, seeing his preparation and knowing that he thinks that he probably hasn't killed anybody, that was enough for me to feel pretty secure. Our cross-country Japan food tour continues as we move from Sendai to Fukushima. I came here to see if life has returned back to normal after the tragic tsunami and nuclear disaster that occurred eight years ago. There was a huge earthquake which caused the tsunami to come and then the tsunami affected the nuclear reactor. How did Japan recover from that? Let's go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we're at it, we're stepping back into Japanese traditions that have withstood the test of time. If you trust me, I want to see how tight of a pattern we can get. <gasps> Three, two, one. <sighs> Including unique foods you wouldn't expect to see in Japan. Uh, can I eat it if I don't look at it? Yeah, I could drop it in your mouth. <laughs> Ending with the fish you do know from Japan, but never expected to see on a dinner plate. Before we get into the cooking, I do want to ask more seriously, like, what is koi in Japanese? Let's get started. As we set foot in Fukushima Prefecture, everything seems normal. Quiet countryside ambiance, the smell of vegetation. But deep inside these fields lies a unique creature that'll become part of an almost unheard of Japanese dish. Here we are, we are in a field in, where, where are we again? Hitakatashi, Fukushima. I'm told we're gonna catch grasshoppers today? Yeah. You seem like a pro because you're wearing gloves. I mean, look how I'm dressed. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not ready. <laughs> this is Masamichi Igawa. He knows everything about countryside living, including what to do with these grasshoppers. People in Japan used to eat them more commonly a long time ago, but the tradition still continues today. I came here about a year ago. I posted a lot of videos about Japan, Japanese food, and there's comments here and there about people being freaked out about radiation in food because of what happened here. How did Japan recover? We had tons of volunteers who came out and actually helped clean up, rebuild. It was a huge effort. It took years. He says that now there's actually no danger anymore. They actually eat the local vegetables, like raw. They actually do screenings and tests for the rice. So it has become safe at this point. Although the food coming from this region has been thoroughly checked and vetted, there's still a lot of work to be done in winning back the trust of other regions and other parts of the world. What I know for sure is these grasshoppers are good to go. Shizzy, I like that you're pushing yourself to do new things. I try my best. <laughs> 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 Catching grasshoppers is pretty easy. Right now, we're literally walking past thousands of them. Spot your prey. Oh, shite, there's big ones here. Move swiftly. Okay, here we go, one, two. Oh, oh no, no! You <laughs> But above all else. There's one literally right here, it's a gift from God. You must commit. Yes. <gasps> Amazing. Thank you, do you think I'm brave? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I've tried delicious food from all over the world. Yeah, fuck. Food that other people cook. Where are they gone? But there's nothing like the sense of satisfaction that comes from getting out there. No, no. Come in. Go. And catching your own meal. I'll try another one. I'm trying. There's a grasshopper on this leaf. It almost wants to be caught. It looks a little sad. It looks a little depressed. It's kind of over this whole living thing. What it wants is to be caught and join his friends in the bottle. But what it needs is for you to take some action. Swoop it up Kay. like the hand of God. <laughs> yes! It's in my hand! Yes! Ah, it's moving around in my hand. I don't like it. You did it! There it is. Look, you got a huge one. <laughs> Can you feel that adrenaline rush? Can you feel amazing like you accomplished something? I am a hunter. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We've got today's secret ingredient. 
Masamichi brings us to a local home where all the cooking action is about to go down, including Japan's riskiest food making procedure. As far as I understand, there's two people with hammers, and then there's one unlucky person who has to stick their hand in there. And that's uh, is our friend right here. How you doing? He's scared. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. Joining our lunch today, mochi, a sticky, gooey classic, symbolizing Japan's timeless ability to innovate with everything around them. It starts by soaking rice in water overnight. The next day, it's strained through a cheesecloth and steamed for one hour before it's pounded in a wooden mortar. Man. If you trust me, I want to see how tight of a pattern we can get. This is the product right here. It's crazy sticky. It won't even come off his hands. Oh my goodness. This is more than I can chew. Let's try it out. Oh. <laughs> it's so weird. It's like the unrefined version. It's so sticky and clumpy. Pure mochi, freshly pounded rice cake with no flavoring added. Are you going to eat this part on your arm? <laughs> mochi is a carby, amorphous base, and there's so much you can do with it. Add vegetable broth to make a mochi soup. Top it with red bean paste. Coat it in soybean flour, creating a yellow, vibrant dessert. And if you want something more wild, top it with natto, Japan's infamous sticky fermented soybean. Hi, what's your name? My name is Yujiro Iwata. Oh, you speak English? No. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. I can't speak English. <laughs> Joining our meal, Mr. Yujiro and his wife, Asami. I think we should jump into it. So, Shizuka. Oh, no. Have you ever had a bug? Never. This is what we came here for. The grasshopper is boiled in hot water to remove any dirt. Then it's stir-fried in a blend of sugar, soy sauce, and sake, a blend that creates homemade teriyaki sauce. I want you to grab a few. Should I help you? I can dish you up some. <sighs> Let me just look at this. Don't look at them. That's the last thing you should do is look at them. <laughs> she got one. Okay, we'll do it together. Listen, look at this. I got two right here. Let's do this. Uh, can I eat it if I don't look at it? Better. Yeah, I could drop it in your mouth. Oh, God. Is that what you want? Kuchini. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm going to try it out. Great. Okay, I'm going to try it out. Hold on. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> it's sweet. It's salty. It's like teriyaki grasshoppers. Teriyaki grasshoppers. Delicious. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crunchy, papery. There's no gooiness. It's a pretty good sell. Mm, it's not bad. It's not bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right here, this is mochi with natto. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh. Do people here, does it just smell good? It's a pretty normal smell for them. It doesn't smell bad, but to me, it's obviously yeah. fermented. Oh, yes. It's stringy. It's so unique. Oh, he just mixes it up like that. You mix it up. <laughs> the more you mix it, the healthier it gets. <laughs> Oh, that's a chewy mouthful. Yeah, I took too much. Couldn't open your mouth for a second. The smell is more intense than the flavor. The flavor <laughs> itself is a bit more mild. Definitely slimy. It's like slime on slime crime over here. It's all just a texture sensation. I'm actually really liking this. Foreign people think it's such a strange food, but in mm. Japan, they'll eat it like every morning. Right here, it's our dessert. Let's try it out. That's some good stuff. Same sticky texture, a little bit sweet, and then a little bit, what do you call that? Like, nutty, earthy? Nutty might be the best way to describe it. To me, this seems like traditional Japanese dessert. It's not like a, a cake with frosting. It's just got some subtle sweetness to it. Talking about the event eight years ago, what kind of impact did that have on your lives here, if any? It was actually working in Tokyo at a company, and then after the earthquake and the disaster happened, that made him want to come back home and support his hometown. That's incredible. Like Yuchiro and his wife, many others returned to Fukushima, helping to rebuild it into what it is today.
Before leaving Fukushima, I've got a unique opportunity to try out a rare freshwater fish native to this part of Japan, a species you may know as koi fish. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. This place is the perfect retreat from the city. Restaurant, hotel, and hot spring in one. Opened 146 years ago and specializing in traditional foods that reflect Japanese culinary history. On your large menu, you've got one dish that stood out to me, but before we get into that, I want to ask what is koi in Japanese? Koi is a carp fish. It's about this big and they get it from local rivers in Aizu. This fish is most famous for its bright, vibrant colors. In Japan, koi fish symbolize persistence, determination, wealth, success, and good fortune. I've seen them in picturesque ponds, but never on a dinner table. Can I tell you something funny? I came here because I thought we we're gonna eat one of those like koi goldfish. It's gonna be like colorful and white and orange and then people are gonna be like, no, don't do it. I'm gonna be like, I'm doing it anyways. Um, but I don't think it's that kind of fish. What kind of koi fish do you have here? You may have thought that you'd be eating those beautiful, colorful koi fish that are usually found in Japanese gardens and ponds. But actually, those are not fish that are meant for eating. And we have separate breed of koi fish that are actually designed for eating. Are they still cute? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kawaii? <laughs> when you grab one, can you try to find like just the cutest one of the ones that you have? Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. These fish, well, they'll meet the business end of a fillet knife and join their friends in a dish called koi umani. Big pieces of fish simmered with soy sauce, sugar, and homemade sake for nine hours. When the fish becomes tender and the broth becomes thick, it's ready to be served. Hey guys, welcome back to the food show. So right here, this is a koi fish. This is also a koi fish. Ta-da! Ta-da! We're in like this restaurant suite, a private room, which has a little bit of everything. Beautiful background. Over here, is that a hot plate? There's a tea station. Over here, they have a, a seven inch TV. Can you explain this place to me? I kind of don't get it. This is a room you can sleep in. So you eat here and then you put your futons out and then you sleep. But sleep it's... or pass out? Probably both, because I mean, Mm. Mm. And here it is, a nice kind of caramelized glaze on the outside, it would seem. And I think I'm gonna start in the middle. Do you think that's egg? I have no idea. Maybe it's grasshopper. No, it better not be. <laughs> it better not be anything but grasshopper. All right, let's try it out. Cheers. 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 That's egg. It's kind of like crumbly on the inside, but it's all kind of held together with this thick, soy-based glaze, a little sweet, yeah. a little salty. Mm -hmm. It tasted like an actual chicken egg, like the yolk that's been cooked. Mm. Let's bust into this meat right here. Right. It comes off real nice. I don't think carp have scales. They do. Uh, I'm quitting my show. Mm. Oh, that's very nice. I would say oishi. It's so soft, it's become tenderized from all the boiling, but a powerful flavor. Mm -hmm. I never expected that carp was going to be this good. It doesn't have any strange aftertaste and very tender. It's delicious. Fukushima, a region acutely plagued with disaster after disaster, is now a symbol of Japanese resilience and persistence, a feat only made possible through the incredible fighting spirit of the Japanese people. Japan series, we are a long way from Tokyo, and we've got a surprise for you that you won't find in any of our competitors' channels, I'll tell you that. Definitely not. This is 
Hayes and Oshima. Host of the 2020 Summer Olympic Sailing Competition and famous for its Enoshima Shrine. But if you know our show, you know that's not why we're here. Go build a better tomb. From this to this, how did that happen? This unique island also boasts some of the most unusual food you'll find in Japan. Okay. Oh, God. And one local secret ingredient seems to find its way into almost every dish. It's so creepy. It looks like a fossil. Today, Shizzy and I are hitting the docks. Hello, sir. Konnichiwa. Sneaking our cameras into the fish factories. What am I eating? And sweet talking our way into the kitchens. I don't like gross little things. All to attempt to get some answers to the question. Whoa. With gold. What happened to the island of Enoshima? Right now we're at the dock pier. What do you call this? Boat area. Yeah. The pier. piece of concrete that has many boats on it. In the southern part of Kamakura City, along the coast sits Koshigo Fishing Port, one of the biggest Shirasu suppliers in the area. Right now we are awaiting the arrival of a local fisherman who has a Shirasu blog? Yes, he does. Every day he's updating how many Shirasus he caught. Shirasu in English is called white bait. They're little tiny white fish. We're eating the bait? That's right. White bait. It's a term for immature fishes that are so small, their only purpose is to swim around and get eaten by bigger, cooler fish. White baits are tender and edible. In Japan, these baby sardines are a delicacy. Our ship has arrived. Hello, sir. Hello, konnichiwa. Very excited. Back from sea, you can see the enthusiasm in their eyes. They're, oh, and they're going past us. It looks like they had an amazing catch. All these huge coolers completely full of shirasu. This is much more than I expected. Yeah. <gasps> oh, oishi. These baby sardines are called shirasu. Processed shirasu appear in many Japanese delicacies, especially across the bay on the island of Enoshima. You guys need help? Nice. Help it uh, out. That's no big deal. It's used in snacks, as a topping, main ingredient, or this. Today's shirasu catch is transported immediately in these coolers to keep them fresh. From here, they take a short ride to a nearby factory for processing. The processing of the shirasu is underway, but are some people eating this raw? They do. Actually, Enoshima is one of the places where you can eat them raw. Normally, you would eat them over a bowl of rice. Oh, you don't think it's normal just to hold no. 20 pounds of fish in your hand no. and eat it raw? No. Okay. Oh, come on. You didn't do grasshopper. You have to do this. Uh, can I eat it if I don't look at it? Yeah, I could drop it in your mouth. Oh, God. I don't like gross little things. Okay, oh, oh, holding it, I'm holding it. Let's try it out. The raw shirasu. Okay. Like, it's a little crunchy. A little salty. And a little like anchovies, but it doesn't have any super strong flavor. No, not it doesn't. All. It's not bad. Oh, you're holding it together pretty well now. I did it. I'm on some next thing. You cannot touch me. It's for the best. You just learn to love me. The fish are gathered and washed. Huge baskets are boiled for five minutes. Too long and the fish fall apart. Do you know why they choose to process it in this way? Is it to preserve it? They usually ship it all across Tokyo. So in order to do that, they usually need to be boiled. After boiling, the fish are placed on a dry net, spread out evenly and left under the sun for 30 minutes. Oh, hey, thank you. That's, that's a lot. No, that's the exact portion I wanted. That's good. <laughs> Okay, they've become sticky. It helps. It helps. Let's go for it. Here you go. Oh, Whoa. better. Much better. They're not as slimy anymore. Not as slimy and not as much like oceanic flavor. It tastes good. From here, they're going to package it up. Many of these go to Tokyo, but a lot of them end up at Sardine Island, which is where we're going next. That's not what it's actually called. That's what I've called it. Welcome to Enoshima Island. I call it Shirasu Heaven, and I came ready to eat. Asahi Hanten is the only place on the island that sells shirasu crackers, with their exclusive recipe made by Mr. Mitsuru Yone. Sir. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. They've been operating for 16 years, hugely popular, 
for those who want to see how an entire octopus can become a cracker in seconds. It's seriously mind-boggling stuff. It doesn't seem feasible. Right now he's working on it. He's putting some oil on this super hot flat top. So he's got an octopus and he's dipped it in potato starch. That's it. This is my favorite part. So he closes it. He bless, 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 bless. Are they dying? Octopus scream. Over. Open, open already. Open. And would you look at that? Three separate octopuses turned into one cracker. How right. is that even legal? Right, I got paper. All right, let's go for it. Smash papery octopus. Mmm. Yummy. Yummy. A little salty, seafoody, but the texture is what I'm more amazed by. It's legit cracker. I thought there'd be some parts that were inconsistent, some parts chewy, some parts soft, and it looks kind of beautiful at the same time. I heard they have two more kinds here. They make one with shrimp and they make one with chirasu. That's why we're here. We're gonna try those next. With almost the same technique and ingredients, they take a shrimp, sit it on a bed of batter, press it for one minute, and it's done. It was kind of normal sized and then they just crushed it. They flattened it's literally like paper thin. That's amazing. The shirasu cooks up a little differently. First, it's blue like the ocean, and the fish are multicolored, also like the ocean. Press it in the Cracker Maker 3000 and Bazoonga. A child's kindergarten art is revealed, and you can eat it too. Oh, that's pretty good, it's fishy. And the texture is super unique. It tastes like you're eating styrofoam. Oh yeah, it's like a little bit of a foamy fish cracker. It still looks crispy. Oh, <laughs> it's a little thicker, a little tougher there. Do you want a head or a butt? Of the butt. Oh. That one's a little more crispy. Oh. Yeah, don't break your teeth. Bro broke it. This is like where the life force of the shrimp ended, was right here. You're right. But it gives it a really strong shrimpy taste. Yeah, that is mm -hmm. shrimpy. Shrimpy. Hmm. Enoshima is just a day trip from Tokyo. These days, it's packed, and the Shirasu boom can be thanked for luring in curious tourists. Hello. <laughs> According to the manager, this restaurant started the Shirasu trend over a decade ago. Here at Tobik Cho, the Shirasu even makes its way into your booze. Well, interestingly enough, this shop actually may have been the start of Shirasu ice cream as well. My main question is, why is there fish in the ice cream? Can you explain that real quick? <laughs> Today's menu, Sanshuru no Shirasu Dan a rice bowl with three different types of shirasu. It starts innocent enough with a bowl of rice. Add some veggies, mayonnaise, sesame seeds, and dry seaweed. Then boiled sardines, soy sauce sardines, and raw sardines. It's finally topped with minced yellow ginger, minced radish, and minced spicy radish. Along with our main dish, shirasu maki sushi and shirasu croquette. It is shirasu heaven in here. If you were a fish that eats bait fish, you would love this restaurant. Or if you were a bird or something. I think we should work our way around the table. First of all, this seems like an appetizer if I've ever seen one. I want to go for half of it. Here we go. Mm-mm. Mm. It's good. I like it. That's food. It wouldn't be my usual choice for this style of a sushi, but man, that is... It's full of fish. Oh, here's sake. So before you came in here, I put the sake, a dried fish chip Whoa. with gold. You're right, there's little gold flakes in it. It's opulent. Well, cheers. cheers. Mm. Next, I want to bust this open and I'm hoping a bunch of fish come swimming out. <gasps> Bamboo charcoal. Where are the fish, man? I came here for the fish. Oh, there they are. They've been kind of minced and mashed a bit. I like that. No gustatory evidence of fish. I love it. What we have here is the classic sirashu rice bowl with three different types of sirashu. Shirasu. Mm. On the side, they have a cooked egg or a raw egg. We can use either one. Add a little bit of soy sauce to it. You gotta mix the yolk first with the soy sauce. And then pour it over. Ooh. Oh, wow. It's so thick and... Yolky. Did you go to the same food reviewing school as me? I'm gonna try this one, because this is the only kind of shirasu I haven't tried 80 times today. Okay. It's one in soy sauce. It's raw. It's, oh, so it is raw also. Yeah. Mm. Okay, that's really nice. I feel like I've come a long way from the beginning of this video. Okay. Oh, oh. 
holding it, I'm holding it. I never thought I would be able to eat raw shirasu, honestly. Because the appearance of foods takes me out of it quite a bit. But I mean, once you can get past that. Anything you set your mind to, you can add fish to. <laughs> Do you wanna have a good time tonight? I wanna have a good time tonight. You know we're gonna have a good time tonight. I said we're gonna have a good time tonight. Let's go! Shirasu! Shirasu! Believe it or not, this is the only Shirasu burger shop on this island, Shonan Burger. First, they toast the buns. Then the Shirasu cake is fried and dipped in a bowl of soy sauce. Add some wasabi, lettuce, Shirasu cake, a pile of boiled Shirasu, and lube it up with some mayo. Here's step one for me. I'm gonna put his little hat on. Put the hat on. My favorite part is I thought they'd put like 10 fish, but look how many fucking fish are in there. <laughs> I don't even taste them. You wouldn't know that there was a shirasu fish in here unless someone told you. I kind of feel them, like they're small and meaty, but that's kind of it. Nice, dense fish patty in there. Just a pile of shirasu. This is one shirasu dish that I think I could actually get on board with. Mmm. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, Hi. Shirasu, they may be tiny, but these little fish have had a huge impact on Japan's most unique food island. Our cross-country Japanese food tour continues, moving from Kanagawa to Shizuoka. I go. You gotta be a psycho to eat this. In search of a food so strange, most local people have never even heard of it. Hey. This is an isopod, a creature living on the ocean floor hundreds of meters below the surface. This is a creature created by Satan himself. A creature man was never meant to see, let alone eat. I don't know, this should be illegal, right? We're hitting the high seas. So exciting. <laughs> Wading through the rolling waves. Ah! <laughs> and hoping for a lucky or not so lucky catch. I'm stuck in an ocean nightmare, it won't end. Welcome to Shizuoka, home of the famous Fuji Mountain. But we came here for something much more special. Sir, thank you so much for having us here this morning. We're about to jump aboard your ship. Do you have a cute name for your boat? It's called Cho Kanemaru. What does that mean? It's a boat name. Okay. How long have you been a man of the sea? Since he was 16, okay. and he is now 70. I thought you were going to say he's now 17. <laughs> <laughs> so for one year. Mr. Hasegawa has been working on a boat his whole life. He started as a deep sea shark fisherman and later transitioned to isopods. Now he and his son provide deep sea tours to adventurous isopod craving travelers like me. But how did they come up with this isopod business idea? One day he started getting them for aquariums and he tried cooking them in this steam pipe over here and it turned out that it was really delicious. Then TV crew came and that's kind of how the popularity spread and now you can even get rice crackers made with isopods. By the way, you're 70? Why do you have more hair than me? It's because he's drinking extract of the sharks that he catches. <laughs> and his hands are beautiful. Are there other benefits for men? His wife gets tired of him because he's so energetic. <laughs> energetic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we fail with the isopods, I'm getting some shark extract. If I was born to be a winner, then I'm gonna grow up to be a go getter the docks, fresh ocean air in my face, feeling hopeful. Only one hour on the high seas separates me from the goal. Also, Shizzy is definitely excited. Come on. If I was born to be a winner, then I'ma grow up and be a go-getter. That's what it is written in yeah. Oh no! Everything was fine a second ago. Now we're in the actual ocean. I'm in the worst spot on the boat. I don't know if you guys can see how crazy these- Whoa! Please! <laughs> Considering Japan is one of the most strict rule-following countries in the world, I am now shocked that Mr. Hasegawa didn't even give us a short safety brief, warning us about this 10-meter long death trap he calls a boat. Seasickness is inevitable. Morale is going from good down to why the hell did Sunny bring us here? 
This is by far the shakiest boat I have ever been on. I don't know how we're gonna actually survive being on the boat. But it's all for a good purpose. It's to show you guys one of the creepiest, craziest, strangest foods they have in Japan. It's called an isopod. They're known as the janitors of the sea. Carnivorous crustaceans munching on all the dead sea animals that fall to the ocean floor. They're part of the circle of life, essential to ocean ecosystems. If you were wondering what happened to your dead goldfish you flushed down the toilet when you were five, these guys probably ate it. We've come here to their buoy. We've dropped anchor. It's a little bit less rocky now, but still not that great. Everyone's feeling pretty sick. How are you feeling right now? I'm trying to fend off the motion sickness. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah. How deep is it? 400 meters deep. Right here, I can see land 400 meters away. That is crazy. Deep below us lie their isopod traps, long black cylinders filled with bait. The isopods can crawl in, but they can't crawl out. Right now, the trap line is slowly being lifted. We don't know when it's gonna come up. It's yeah. going like a meter a second. While we wait, let me share some tips on how to shoot a show on the water. Tip one, make it fun. This is like the fourth level of fun. Tip two, cast a fearless and articulate host. Are there cages down there? They've got a big cage. They had a buoy to mark where the cage is. As soon as they bring this cage up, it's gonna be a big cage. Any minute this cage is gonna come up here, and maybe we got a bonus cage. Tip three, research. You should know exactly Exactly what to expect. Ah, uh, here it is. So it's not even a cage, it's a cylinder. Oh, what the fuck? What are those creatures? Oh no, it's got little isopods. It's like a cross between a cockroach, lobster, and a nightmare. These isopods look strong, active, and ready for eating. First, they must be dispatched. Sliced down the front, expelling a toxic putrid ball of oceanic waste from their gut. It's the worst thing I've ever smelled. The camera guy can confirm that. I guess I want Oh no! <laughs> What's that, the isopod or the ocean sickness? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Guys, can we keep going? I don't know if we can keep going. This isn't really what I had planned. Today was supposed to be a fun food adventure on the high seas. Instead, morale is low. But it's not always about fun. We're on a mission to dig up Japan's most bizarre food. And now, we have enough isopods for a lifetime. The seas are a bit choppy. The crew's taken a hit. We had a little bit of a spew problem here and there. I mean... We did accomplish our mission. We got the sea bugs. I don't think you're gonna find this anywhere else in the world. If these creatures weren't strange enough, wait until you see how the captain cooks them. The gutted isopods are tossed in a wire cage, and the cage is set in the boat's exhaust pipe. Roasting, or rather scorching, these creepy crawlers in fumes that can reach over 2,000 degrees. Before we chow down, we're heading back to the dock so the team can get a much needed escape from the ocean's never ending onslaught of choppy waves. Guys, we have just got back to land. Oh, sweet land. Look at it, it's right there. Oh, I love that land. <laughs> So, now that we're not rocking so much, I can get a closer look. This is the isopod. It's got this little tail, kind of similar to a lobster. And then its mouth, what is its mouth even doing? This whole part is soft and it's full of food. Every animal that dies and just drifts to the bottom of the ocean, these guys munch on that. <gasps> it's honestly like God told Satan, you can design one creature. He made this and then he goes, okay, great, but that can only be on the bottom of the ocean. Oye, oye, qu'il disait pour propager les nouvelles Un coup de décibel, on me détruit la cervelle Shizzy is out. The producer is out. The camera guys are out. They tussled with the ocean and lost. I found a deck hand to hold the camera, and Shizzy's loss has become Captain Hasegawa's gain as he joins me for a seaside continental brunch. Let's jump into it. Can you show me how to do it? All right, so he takes the head, he kind of hollows that out, then he cuts that away. It looks like there might be a bit of meat in there. Now cutting away the rest of the hard top. Whoa, we can eat that? Dozo. Me. Dozo. Wait, only me? Dozo. But what about both of us? Omote nashi, dozo. 
I don't know what he's saying, but I understand what he's saying. He's saying, hey, you're the one who paid to go on this trip. I never wanted to eat isopods. Okay, I'm gonna eat this one. I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh, so I'm gonna just grab the meat. Here we go. It's a little sweet, a little bit of exhaust fumes and charcoal, and then a little bit of crabby kind of flavor. And I think we're good, and I think you guys feel good. You feel resolution. We went out there, we got the thing, I ate it. Did we capture the moment enough? Okay, I'm gonna eat one more. I made a rule a long time ago, early on when I was in the Philippines, it said if I can eat one of something, I can eat two of something. It's weak to take a bite and then just run. When they have Japanese TV crews come out here, they'll actually take a bunch of these and go stir fry them. But I kind of like his chimney smoking method more. It's kind of romantic. Are you gonna eat with me? Yes! Cheers! Hi! Psycho! Psycho! You gotta be a psycho to eat this. But actually, psycho means excellent in Japanese. From here, do you have any of that uh, shark um, extract? I'm gonna see my girlfriend in a few days and I wanna make her happy. So. <laughs> psycho! psycho. <laughs> yeah. I'm a psycho! <laughs> Oh my god, shark oil. Should I drink it or what do I do? Come on, come on. Drink? Come on. All right, oh my god. All right, let's try it out. Oh, yeah. It's like fish oil. Eh? Eh? <laughs> don't, don't, no, don't zoom down too much. Watch. We'll get demonetized. Incredible experience. Thank you so much. You killed it. Arigato gozaimasu. Isopods taught me more than I could ever learn about them. They taught me that even if your goal is hard, I'm almost definitely gonna puke today. Look forward to that. Even if the ocean is fighting against you, <laughs> even if your crew will never speak to you again, yeah, you're part of the story now. Sometimes you need to push past the pain in pursuit of something bigger. Welcome back to our Japan series. My name is Sunny. And I'm Shizuka. And today we're in Kobe. What if it's that kind of show? <laughs> it makes you want to vomit a little bit, right? <laughs> Japan has the highest value, most coveted beef around the world. And Kobe is Japan's beef capital. First of all, this city is obsessed with beef. When you walk through and around the main station, there are more beef restaurants than I've seen anywhere. It's not unusual to see cattle selling at auction for ten to fifteen thousand dollars a head. I'm just so curious with Kobe. I know there's the quality and the genetics, but how do you justify that price? In this video, we're getting a rare look behind the scenes, going where few outsiders have gone before. Touring a Kobe beef farm and joining a live auction. Something, something, something. Revealing the secrets behind how Japan has engineered the best beef in the world. Turn big dreams into action. We gotta mix action with the passion. Time short, no time for relaxing. Be the first in, last out, make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to N Kobe Beef Live Performance, a place that lives up to its name, with veteran teppanyaki chef and owner, Mr. Kita Takahiro at the helm. Teppanyaki is flat top Japanese cooking, right before your eyes with your very own personal chef. He starts off by getting some vegetables going. Wow, such an appetizer. So, Ooh, whoa. Ketchup's around a lot. This is amazing. It's like it's dinner and a show at the same time. First. Before things really start heating up, he's serving an appetizer. A combination of Kobe beef tongue, orange, mint, horseradish, and green and purple onion. Oh. Today we'll experience the finest beef in the world, Kobe Wagyu. A steak this big costs about $250. According to the owner, his restaurant only purchases beef that comes from local breeders. And before we dive into that marbled chunk of heaven, we're gonna see exactly how it got here. First of all, thank you for having us today. Yeah, welcome. Meet Mr. Nitoshi. 
His farm has been passed down from generation to generation for the last 80 years. Today, he'll confirm or dispel the rumors of Japanese farmers massaging cows, playing them classical music, or feeding them beer, all in an effort to produce top quality beef. We're here because we want to know the secrets about Japanese beef, especially Kobe here in in Kobe. Usually it's a secret, but just for you, he's going to tell you about it today. And I won't tell anybody. <laughs> See, secret. Secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a cute laugh. Japan has four famous domestic breeds of cattle. This is one of them, the Black Tajima, found exclusively in the Hyogo Prefecture, where Kobe City is located. Does this cow have a name? He calls him Kuro, which means black. But usually it's easier to be more specific by number. Well, 8443, it's been nice getting to know you. Farmers like Nitoshi have no idea what their cattle's meat will be rated or how much money they'll bring in until they go to auction. So before that, they try to ensure optimal living and growing conditions for each animal. That means fresh mountain air, a reasonable amount of living space, at least compared to American factory farms, and high quality food. The main thing that he gives the cows is essentially just hay and water. He gets the best from around the world, the highest quality hay from Australia, Canada, and the US, and that's what he feeds these cows. Not just hay, but three times a day, he feeds them a mixture of corn, soy scraps, and other mixed greens and roughage. In the US, up to 75% of the cattle's diet is made up of corn, much more than in Kobe. If someone were to buy a cow, how much would that cost? One cow would cost about a million yen. How do you justify that price? This breed is actually decreasing in number, so there's higher demand, but there's not as many cows. Only about 3,000 cattle qualify as Kobe quality each year. Despite the intense demand for Kobe beef around the world, farmers like Nitoshi still place an emphasis on quality over quantity. They have water misting. Sometimes it's water, but actually it's a... Sake. No, like a sanitization liquid. So it's to keep them clean. How often do they get showered? Depends on the day, but about once every five minutes. Oh. <laughs> I'm just so curious because there's all this mythical lore about Kobe beef. So what's real and what's bullshit? Ah, bullshit! There's bullshit right there! <laughs> so do farmers really massage the cattle? The massage rumor is probably false. Maybe if a TV company came, maybe they would do it. Could you pretend to massage them for our video? Okay, then do they play classical music? He actually tried doing that at the beginning, playing his own music that he liked a little bit, but then he just stopped. So what music did you try to play that you liked? Green Day. Green Day? Wait, see, oh, I can't even believe this is real. Well, then they must at least be getting them buzzed on Japanese beer. He drinks the beer. <laughs> <laughs> the more likely reality is that Japan's beef cattle have better genetics and have been meticulously bred and developed for hundreds of years. They are trying to protect the DNA. They're known for having a particularly pure bloodline. This is prized DNA that will never leave this country unless it's in the form of a steak. I think we should cheers. I mean, it's a special moment yes. right now. Cheers. Cheers, come by. Mm. I love sake. We have one more here I think we should try out. This is Kobe on a leaf. Here we go. Mm. Very yummy. Mm -hmm. Nothing too crazy, adding a little bit of temptation. Yeah, it's the perfect appetizer, but we're ready for the real deal next. We are moments from biting into the ultimate A5 Wagyu, beef that is world renowned. I want nothing more than to get this started, but I gotta know what A5 even means. This is a site few outsiders have been granted permission to see. You've heard of farm to table, this is the step in between. Hundreds of cattle from various farms across the Hyogo prefecture. Soon the auction will begin, but beforehand, each specimen is carefully photographed and graded. There's no playing favorites here, even if you have the best breed and the best intentions. If your beef can't compete, it's gonna get a lower grade. What is the temperature in here? Below 10 degrees. It's pretty darn cold. Grading is done by the Japan Meat Grading Association. Among all these Tajimas, only some are graded A4 or A5, qualifying as bona fide Kobe beef. 
This stamp makes it official. I saw a lady a moment ago with a futuristic looking machine and she was like taking pictures here. It is a camera and they're actually just taking photos of the meat for record purposes. Holy crap, that's intense. In Japan, the beef grades go from B1 to A5. The higher the grade, the better the quality and taste. The letter is in relation to exactly how much meat is actually on the cow, how thick it is, how much meat is on there. The number rating is related to the marbling and the actual quality of the meat. Besides yield and marbling, they also examine the texture, brightness, and firmness of the meat. As a farmer, what can I do to ensure that my beef is always A5? Is there anything I can do? This is probably one of the difficult points. Even if you work really hard as a farmer, you still end up with different grades of meat. But in the end, it kind of depends on the personal skill of the farmer. This is why Nakanashi Farm, where we went earlier today, is leading the industry with over 90% of their cattle rated as official Kobe beef. After inspection, the highest rated beef receives the Champion Kobe Beef Award. This prized beef kicks off the bids for the day, setting the stage for what will be millions of dollars worth of beef sold. Japan's usually a pretty quiet place. Not right now. There's a lot of people in here, a lot of anticipation. Restaurant owners, butcher shops, traders of meat, all coming here to place their bid. Right now, they're literally rolling in the beef. Bidding has begun. Everyone's been looking at the beef, kind of taking notes on which products they liked. People are electronically voting for which one they want. All right, they just made a sale. They bid on the price per kilogram. The highest bid gets the whole head of cattle. So this is 440 kilograms, 3,800 yen. That was $15,000 for one cow. That's crazy. After it's been auctioned, the meat takes a ride to a holding fridge until it's brought to a restaurant, cut, portioned, and seared in front of two very hungry patrons. Let's do it. Hi. So first thing he does is give it a spritz of salt, a little bit of pepper. The fat in Kobe beef, it melts very easily, and it can even melt in with just the heat of your own mouth. So in order to make it just right, they want to cook it a little bit, and then it'll be not too oily for you. Oh, he's going to light it on fire. Okay. What? Ready. Oh, 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 my God. oh man. I no, felt that. That was really hot. That was fascinating. That was amazing. Oh, he's cutting it already. There it is. Oh. I'm gonna put just a little bit of salt on it. You gotta eat it while it's hot. Let's do it. Cheers. Thus. Thank you. What have I done to the dessert this moment? Mm. It is like kind of a tender fat sponge almost. Each bite, some delicious juices just squeeze out. It's touching her heart. In fact, the oils are rushing now to her heart, but it's like heaven too. Oh shit. Oh shit. I see him, he's being transported to another land. A trip to heaven right now. He might be prancing through some fields like a happy puppy. <laughs> you wow. for it, and you're back. I'm getting chills when they tell me you're not your Son of a bitch. That's unreasonably delicious. People who are familiar with wasabi, they're maybe used to having it with sushi, but mixing it with the beef, it's something special. It elevates it, it adds a different level to it. But beyond that, that's like the real wasabi. So it's coming like from the wasabi root and not the fake wasabi paste. That's right. I think a lot of people look at the price and you can't think of it like, oh, I could go to the store and get a steak for cheaper. It's totally about the experience. It's about being here, being in the city of Kobe, having your own personal chef who's cooked thousands of cows in his life. Or thousands of meals, as meals. I thought you were gonna say. I think we could totally enjoy the meal just so much more just by watching the process of making it. Yeah. And of course, just seeing his smile. He has such a lovely smile. Camera B, do we have the smile? <laughs> <laughs> Kobe beef is a living, breathing legacy, symbolizing the meticulous, unending effort of Japanese farmers over hundreds of years. When you drop $200 on a couple hundred grams of beef in this city, you're not just taking a bite of the best the world has to offer, you're taking a bite of history. Cheers! Awesome Bye. meal. Oh, that was amazing. I'm just drunk at this point. 
trip has been amazing. Because of Sunny, I've been able to go to a whole bunch of places that I never visited before yet in Japan. I've tried many foods that I've never had before. But also, because of Sunny, I've had to touch bugs. No! <laughs> I've had to eat raw shark heart. Oh, you actually did it? Oh my god. I'm not gonna eat that. And I've had to endure three hours on the actual rockiest boat of my life. <laughs> so, today is about payment. I'm trying to get into Shizuka's mind right now to figure out what she could be planning for today. I'm guessing it's something uh, cute, enjoyable, maybe sweet, like a multicolored cotton candy. I don't know. It's gonna be cute, right? Cute, green. Kawaii! Kawaii! Today I'm making Sunny eat warasubo. These are mud-dwelling eels. Famous in Saga, terrifying to look at. But even better, I'm gonna make Sunny catch them first. And he's gonna have no idea. Should be a pretty easy day. I just hope it's interesting for you guys. So, let's see what she's got planned. Today, Shizuka has brought me to Ariake Sea. From April through October, low tides mean the sea turns into a huge mudflat, revealing all the amphibious organisms. As soon as I look in the water, I see it's teeming with life. There's little crabs, there's mud skippers. Uh, are we here for any of that? Actually, no. We're fishing for something else today. It's a little different from a mud skipper, but I would say they're kind of cute. I knew you were gonna make us do something cute. <laughs> you know me so well. Our amphibious guide, Mr. Nakashima, has been in the fishing business for over 10 years. With his experience and our passion, catching these creatures will be a piece of Coke. Cake. Is it Coke or cake? Hey, is it Coke or cake? Coke? That doesn't make sense. Who wrote this? Well, hello there. Thank you for having us today. Today, we are here at the Mud Flats doing some epic fishing. I'm told the animal we're fishing for today is cute. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, some people would say it's cute. Yeah, it's cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Are we guaranteed to catch some fish today? Recently, he's been catching quite a lot of them, so he okay. thinks that we will be able to. That's good. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh, let's catch some fish. Let's go. To catch a fish, you must become a fish, starting with this unique surfing board. It allows me to spread my weight out across a larger area, preventing me from sinking into the mud. We're pumped. We're excited. We're going to jump in the ocean. I mean, the mud. Let's go! Oh shit. <laughs> oh yeah. Unlike a regular waterboard, you don't use paddles. You don't use your hands. <laughs> you only need a strong thrust from your leg region. Hey, that's pretty slick. You're going the wrong way. No! <laughs> <laughs> Bye! <laughs> okay. So we've come literally about five kilometers out here. Can you still see the shore? Oh shit, you can. All right, we've come very far out. Now what? We're gonna look for some holes, and then between the holes, we scoop. Okay, so what about here and here? Do those, yes? Oh, he just got one. Oh, I mean, not yet, but. Are you making the sashimi right now, brother? <laughs> Why'd you have to say the word joke at the end of your translation? <laughs> are my jokes not obviously jokes? <laughs> okay, jokes so. Are hard to translate. I'm just telling you, he just cut the mud seven times. Now what? Well, it won't actually cut because it's not sharp, but this is the movement. In places like this, the mud gets a little bit harder to see, so it might be better to split up. Oh, okay. Yes. You're afraid I'm gonna steal all the fish. Okay, guys, I'm going off board. Oh, oh no, that was a mistake already. There's a hole here, and there's a hole here. So maybe in the middle, there's a fish. Let's go for it. Come on. All right, there's no fish there. Did we bring any fish to like throw in the mud and be like, oh, here's a fish? No. That's what we usually do. All right, I'm getting back on my boat. Oh, why did I get off my boat? One would say that based on my body type and my spirit animal, <laughs> the mud would be my natural habitat. But life out here is harder than I expected. Oh, my boat's sinking. I hope it'll all be worth it when I meet these cute fish Shizuka can't stop talking about. Jizzy, can I say I'm glad that I let you choose the adventure this time? We're having a great time. Of course. Hold on, guys. I got something. What's this? What the hell is that? It's a log. Yeah, it's not a fish. Oh, sorry. 
hour four of mud fishing. We're having a lot of fun, and we've caught zero fish! Sorry, I lost my temper. Evidently, there's fish somewhere in this mud. I don't know who put them there. We're trying to get them out. It's pretty hard. Even the guy who's an expert, he looks like he's given up too, but we can't give up. If we don't get any goddamn fish, we don't have an episode. So we press on. He got one! Yes! Oh yes. my god! Yes! He got one! Yes! He did it! It's yes. possible! I never had a shred of doubt. Even he looks forlorn and lost right now. Oh, I can't wait to see it. It did look kind of cute from here. It's long and it's a little muddy. Let's go say hi. Our effort is not fruitless. He's caught one. I just saw it from afar. It did look kind of cute. It's gonna be super cute. I'm gonna pull it out right now. As I look at this creature, I start to realize it's a trap. This isn't supposed to be a fun day. This, <gasps> I'm not gonna eat that, is ah, it's moving out of my hand. revenge. Oh, what the f ah! oh, it bit me, it bit oh me. <laughs> That's not cute at all! You made me suffer on this trip. You deserved it. This is a Warasubo, also known as the aliens of Ariake Sea. What's up? This eel-like fish has been caught and eaten by locals in the past. These days, this gnarly creature serves as a local mascot to promote tourism in the area. You know, I appreciate the tip about looking the holes, but hey, they bite you. That would have been a good tip. Wow, these things are Dishes. So you eat these? Uh, yeah, some people in Saga Prefecture do, I guess. Okay, yeah, not all people in Japan. No. We got what we came for, but just one is not enough. Two eaters means we need at least two warasubo. <laughs> oh shit! Oh shit! You got one? Oh shit! Oh, I got one! Yeah. <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> Ah, it's trying to bite me, you little bastard. Oh, I can't believe it. There's nothing like the rush of hunting down your own food and providing for your family or co-host. It's nature's cocaine, and I'm searching for another line. Well, guys, I would love to stay here all day up to my balls in mud, but um, I think we gotta go eat what we got. Can't wait for her to get a taste. And really to just look it in the eyes, maybe give it a kiss on the lips. Right, Chizzy? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a champion! Today, the creature which we will call food will be prepared in a local pub named Toki Izakaya, run by Miss Alalagi Tokiko for the last 43 years. Her specialty, drinking food, which is perfect because I'm going to need a buzz to get this one down. Hello there. Thank you for having us today. We just caught these Watasubo. Is she proud? Yes. <laughs> for people in Sega, these are friends. Yeah, it bit me on the finger. <laughs> Did it hurt? No. <laughs> Even when you cook them, they'll bite you. What? These cute creatures, as Shizuka calls them, are normally impaled through their head while they're alive and hung to dry. Do you eat it like this, like some fish jerky? The best one is this, and the second is in miso soup. The third best way to eat it is sashimi. And that's what we're here for. The preparation method of choice is called ikezukuri, a Japanese word that translates to prepared alive, a method used for some octopi, fish, shrimp, and today's unlucky warasubo. So she starts from the tail, works her way towards the head. The meat itself is super red, like blood red. Not enjoying this. It grosses you out? I think it's not nice. I'd I, rather them just chop its head off. A lot of people would agree with you. It's actually outlawed in some countries like Germany. I think it should be, but uh, Japan values the freshness. Now she's told me to put this on it. I'm not sure what this does. Oh! <gasps> it bit the spoon! Oh, shush. Oh! What? What is this? It's sake. It's sake. Oh, these are little alcoholics. There's no way it's still alive. It's definitely still alive. But that's just its nervous system. Yeah, what does she think? She's like, yeah, it's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna try it? I don't know if I can try this one. How about these two heads? Boom, cover it with a lemon. No, 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 that doesn't make a difference. It's just literally the skin of the fish that you just shaved off. Yeah, I can't cover that. That's the actual food. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try it out. Let's go for it. 
Mm. Oh, it's like a penis fish. Really? It's very chewy. I like it. The taste itself, it's not off-putting, it's not fishy. But honestly, the outside skin is like sandy and coarse. It's like grade one sandpaper. Well, little guys, thank you for giving your life. That was pretty good, actually. I'll try it again. And that's only the third best way. Aren't you excited that there's still two more ways that are even better? Yes, so excited. <laughs>
and don't stop at the end. You can be these are the most strict street food stalls you'll find anywhere in the world. Right behind me, these guys are setting up right now. That's a crazy amount of work just so I can sit on my ass, have some drinks, and some damn good food. You never know, you can be this isn't ordinary street food. I really got This <laughs> is Yatai. We have come to our first Yatai. Can you tell me a little bit about this place? This is a family-run Yatai business. Right. Now, originally, the dad he started this business, and then the mother and the son are running it too. That's dope. Right here, this very spot, this small chunk of sidewalk has been theirs every night for the last 35 years. A not-so-ordinary street stall with a wide-ranging menu. But tonight, I have a pork fetish, and I'm into feet. Have you ever had pig's feet? I've never had pig's feet. Oh man, you're getting so many new adventurous opportunities. So many, many. I get it mainly because it looks like a foot and they usually walk on the ground with the feet. Yes. But the foot is actually full of fat and collagen, which is good for your skin. For the skin, yeah, yeah, and wrinkles. This not so commonly used pig part is a favorite for those sipping sake in Japan. The feet are braised in a soy sauce base for five hours, then thrown on the grill, lightly seasoned and served simply with shredded cabbage and vinegar soy sauce. We've got some skin here. Well, that's just pure gelatinous fat. It's super tender. It is a little bit gamey smelling still. Ugh. <laughs> mm. Mm, okay. It's much better than I thought. The texture really reminds me of like an undercooked, very soft, chewy rice, like almost a mochi rice. It's a little bit of animaliness, but the thing with drinking food is it's supposed to give you a jolt of intensity so that you have a reason to wash down your beer. True. How you doing? <laughs> True. <laughs> Every night at dusk, when the sun sets over Fukuoka City, on street sides and alleyways, these yatai come to life. But what does yatai mean to Fukuoka? Meet Higashi Koichiro. He owns a yatai called Jonetsu no Chido Riyashi, ensuring he can bring the best experience to his customers each night starts here. Hello, sir. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. Higashi is a newcomer to this traditional style of dining, only running his outdoor eatery for the last two and a half years. But his izakaya, the birthplace for most of his culinary creations, has been around for 50 years. The word yatai, does it have a literal meaning? Yatai is Essentially what a yatai is, it's a transportable food cart. And for him, what they do is they bring their cart out onto the street, and then at the end of the day, they pack up and they bring it back to the restaurant. I was in the USA recently, and I was talking to a lot of small independent restaurant owners about their restaurants and the regulation they have to deal with, and they are finding it more and more difficult to meet the demands that are put upon them by different government agencies. And I'm curious, as somebody who owns a Yatai, what challenges do you face when it comes to regulation in Japan? We have a very strict regulation for size of the space. The actual size that you're allotted is 3 meters by 5 meters, and the size of your actual yatai shop should be within 3 meters and 2.5 meters. Oh my god. Due to regulations, you can only start from 5 p.m., and then you have to leave by 4 a.m. And of course, you can't leave anything behind. It needs to look exactly as it did before, of course. Right. The number of yatai have greatly reduced in Japan as governing officials attempt to clean up the streets. But even some local people see them as eyesores, creating more ruckus than they're worth. For some, who stick to the old ways, running a yatai goes beyond a profession. For them, it's a performance. Can we talk loud in the confines of the yatai? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we're outdoors. 
Hakaruya Thai Shop has been around for 62 years, having passed through three generations. A cozy space that seats 10 at most, but still, people line up for their turn at the Yatai table. Here, as part of their menu, they served us up some of their classics. We've got the gyoza. I'm gonna split these apart. It's super crispity. It's been yeah. seared in a pan, mm -hmm. so you can see it's very seared. Gyoza, dumplings filled with ground meat and vegetables wrapped in a thin dough. Here, it's served with yuza kosha, a hot citrusy soy sauce. Wait, you're gonna dip it in the yuza kosha. It isn't complete without this. Ooh. Mm. Oh, that is so crispy. <laughs> it's the holy matrimony of deliciousness having its wedding reception on my tongue. That's so nice. It's a great metaphor. <laughs> it's crispy on the bottom, chewy on the top, and it's full of delicious spiced meats. I love it. Mm, this is a great Yatai food. Here, Sabadi. It's translated as diaphragm. I've actually never had diaphragm before. Sagadi is thin, tender skirt steak. Put it on a skewer, toss it on the grill, sprinkle with salt and pepper, and it's ready for an intimate night with your taste buds. Ooh. Yeah, it's like medium rare, tender, juicy. The pepper really brings out a nice flavor to the meat. Everything here is just meant to be little bites, little taste, flavors, textures to go in between all the drinking. So the more you eat, the more you want to drink, the more you drink, the more you want to eat. It's a vicious cycle. It could get out of control pretty quickly. It really can. The variety of your Thai food is limitless, and the prices are more reasonable than you might think. $5 for ramen. Tofu soaked in odang broth and beef tendon for just a few bucks. That's pretty good for some tofu. That's right. I like it. Or this, a rare wild meat you don't often see served in restaurants. Meet head chef Yoshito Takahashi. Well, hello there, Yoshi. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Working together with Mr. Higashi, they're winning over locals and newcomers night after night. So right now he's deboning the hind quarter of a deer. Where'd you get a deer leg? <laughs> I'm dying to know what is the key to outstanding Yatai service. He says that a lot of people feel a little nervous about going to Yatai. Mm. In the city, it's hard to kind of like go and sit down next to someone you don't know. Mm. Uh, he believes it's his role to help them feel at ease and enjoy the experience. That's incredible. The party's about to get started in five hours. But first, Oishi. Oishi. Psycho. Yes. Psycho. Psycho. Psycho, yes. When I was a teenager helping my dad butcher deer, I never thought of actually eating the tenderloin raw. Just take a quick look at this, this game meat. It's so deep red, like scarlet, no fat in there. This is a deer that's been eating organic its whole life. He said they can't serve it to guests that way, but I'm in the kitchen, I've got special access. Eat together? Yes. All right, let's do yes. it. Yes, let's go. I like your enthusiasm <laughs> for raw meat. It's like really good. That's a lot of meat. No super strong flavors at all. Nothing gamey. It's just super clean, salty, like animal oil coating my mouth. That's cool. So every time you're preparing, there's a boss man on that, you just eat a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Right behind me, these guys are setting up right now, and I do not envy the work these guys go through each day. First of all, the cart, which fits an incredible amount of stuff in there. They have the sink, chairs, pots, pans, burners, everything that fits inside. Now, you can see they've opened it up, set it up, cleaned it up, and then finally, at the end, get the food out, and then start preparing the food. That whole process takes about an hour and a half. Something I'm gonna keep in mind next time I see these on the street is all the work that goes into it, just so I can sit on my ass, have some drinks, and some damn good food. Here we are, after a long day, seeing how they prepare all this food, the results are here. It is like five-star street food. Yoshi does not take his food prep lightly. He's the captain of this ship, monitoring each guest around him, making sure they get whatever they need. I ordered a deer sausage. I thought he would just cut a hot dog into five pieces, throw it in a bowl and give it to me, and then it's like a work of art. First a fried cheese roll, then fried sausage along with veggies. Artfully plated, Yoshi meticulously smearing sauces, plating each vegetable with precision. And then that cheese roll, bringing the dish to life and a fat deer sausage plopped on top. 
This yeah. is my first venison, by the way. Bambi. I wouldn't eat Bambi by choice, but here we are. Oh, that's really damn good. That's very juicy. I would guess that they put some pork in there too. Since deer meat is a little bit low on oil and fat, he's cooking it in pork fat. So the meat is still 100% deer. What even is this? That's some fancy ass cheese. Crispy Parmesan cheese. Mm. That's wonderful. High quality, beautiful to look at food is Yoshi's strength. Like this deer steak set upon a bed of flower petals. It's game meat, but it's not game me at all. And wild boar meat, too. There's a lot of different flavors in that one bite. It's the next level of yum. Mm. It's not just about the food or the booze, although I am a big fan of both. Can we get three? Can you drink one? I like it. Oh, yeah. yay! It's about who you're here with. Come on. Come on and who you might bump into along the way. Guys, are we gonna be showing up? Huh? <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! Yes! Right now, just a little bit past 9 p.m., they're just warming up. In Japan, you can feel this switch turn where people go from intense office jobs, expectations, obligation, and then they flip the switch and forget about everything else. I think in Japan, the phrase work hard, play hard really, really fits the bill. Yeah, absolutely. These days, yatai is a tradition only found in Fukuoka, a tradition whose time may be limited. But while it's here, Vendors all around the city are going through the back-breaking work of prepping food, setting up shop, and pouring drinks. Just to break it all down that night, leaving no trace of what hangovers and laughs were shared the night before. Shizzy, you killed it. Thank you so much. Thank Guys, you. that is a wrap on Japan. I will see you next time. A oh, Oh, I'm gonna Woo! get more. Alcohol, uh, sleep. I mean, sleep and vitamins. I'm gonna take vitamins. I'm taking I'm gonna get vitamins. I'm alcohol. Now. Yes. Woo! <laughs>